Welcome to Green Building Matters, the podcast that matters for green building professionals. Learn insight in green buildings as we interview today's experts in lead and well. We'll learn from their career paths, war stories, and all things green, because green building matters. And now our host, and yes, he has every lead and well credential, here's Charlie Cicchetti! Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. I'm really excited today. I'm in New York City, and I'm meeting with Michael Dean, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Turner Construction, one of the biggest construction companies in the United States. And we're going to have a a fun chat today, going way back early in his career to now we're talking net zero buildings and the latest and greatest ways to improve our construction projects. So, Mike, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Um, Here on the Green Building Matters podcast, we talk about careers, so take us back to maybe even, you know, Colorado and your college days there. How did you first get into sustainability? Did going to college in Colorado for your undergrad have any influence maybe on your sustainability path? Oh, it, it, it did uh, in, a, in a roundabout sort of way. So, yeah, I went to, I went to Colorado. I was uh, originally uh, majoring in architecture, um, but I kind of flamed out of architecture school, Okay, um, partly because of calculus and physics, but also partly because of the, the time I went to school and it was, you know, the Vietnam War era. Sure. Um, and uh, I, I didn't, wasn't really happy with, with the architecture program, but I really liked buildings. So I took a year off from school and I, I worked as a carpenter. Nice. And I came back to school and I changed my major to American history and got a degree in history. So that sort of led me to old buildings. And, uh, and then many years later, when I was in my mid-30s, I got a master's degree in historic preservation from Columbia University, uh, which sort of combined those two interests. And I went to work for the city of New York as a project manager. And because of my background, it, it, there, was a, there was actually a big intervening period when I, when I was in undergraduate school. Um, to graduate with a degree in history, you needed to take a two semesters of gym, right? Okay, sure. And, you know, when you're young, you do crazy things. And instead of taking uh, track and field or whatever, I, I decided to take a, a dance class. Okay. And I really liked it. And so I kept taking more dance classes. And by the time I graduated school, I actually came to New York. I said, I'm going to try this dance thing out okay. for a year and see what happens. And I ended up doing it for 15 years. <clears throat> you know. So so that... So that was what I did between undergrad and grad school. And, and at a certain point in my mid thirties, I thought, well, okay, it's time to grow up now. So what do I want to do? And all those early things that I was interested in came back and historic preservation seemed to be a way to put all the pieces together. And um, when I got the job at the city of New York, uh, I worked in their cultural institutions program unit. So I was working on city landmarks and theaters. I did a lot of work at the public theater. And then from there, I, I had different kinds of jobs sort of all around the table. I went to work for the New York Public Library in their construction office. And then I worked for another large construction company. And by then, it was, it was 2001. Right. And we got a job to build a green building. And my boss came to me and he said, OK, so uh, we're going to build this green building. You're going to be the green building project manager. Now, go figure out what that means. Because nobody knew, because Lead had just come out as the version oh, yeah. one pilot, 2000, yeah. and and it was the first time that anybody had had put together a list of what it means to be green or, or sustainable, and how do you get there? And uh, I just dove right into it to the point where I was almost jeopardizing my my job um, because I was interested in. Uh, in promoting sustainability, and I said, I think this is really important, and, and we should go after green jobs and get really good at doing it. And the company I was working for said, well, we don't think that's that important, and just you know, keep doing your project manager work. You know, for those listening, it's so important to slow down and have tell stories. My dad was a journeyman carpenter here in New York. <laughs> My uncle was a dancer in the '80s here in New York. No and I graduated from Georgia Tech, but with a business degree because I started civil engineering, and I didn't like that extra calculus or physics. So we have more in common than we thought, wow, Michael. Charlie, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, sustainability, you got your first lead credential in 2003. Yeah, I got, I got my lead AP in 2002. I, I actually, one of my claims to fame is I organized and hosted the first lead workshop in New York. Oh, nice. In 2001. And uh, and I, I attended the workshop, but it took me two years to get around to taking the test. It's like everybody <laughs> sure, else. Like, sure, sure. New York, Colorado. So are you from New York originally? I'm from New York. Okay. Um, so that's why you uh, came back. Went away and then and then came back. I mean, I came home. I was, you know, just fresh home. out of college. I, I lived at home for six months like everybody does. Had your fun in Boulder. Now, did you ski or snowboard or you know, I hike? There, I went out there to ski and um, um, I brought my skis with me. <laughs> okay, and, nice. And it was so expensive to ski. And I was such yeah. a poor college student. I skied absolutely. I skied one time. Oh, one time. <laughs> And uh, and never never had the. It is expensive. The, Those the, lift the, tickets the, are the expensive. Two thousand three lead AP. Fast forward to today, though, you're a lead fellow, which is uh, an amazing designation. What did that mean to you when you were when you became a lead fellow? Well, it was it was um, recognition of uh, of a commitment and a certain level of achievement that wasn't just in my own head, but was recognized by my peers and recognized by the industry. Um, and you're right, it's a, it's, it's, so far it's a, um, a small group of people and, and because I think you have to be a, a lead AP for 10 years before you can even be considered. You're right. It tended to be folks who were around at the beginning um, and these are folks that I've now worked with um, for 10 or 15 years or more. Um, you know, on the USGBC board sure. and on the committees, or or doing projects, or or promoting sustainability. Um, so it was sort of the fraternity and sorority of of, uh, of the early adopters. And grassroots. And I'm just I'm just glad to be considered among among that group of people. That's fantastic. So you get back to New York, you get your master's, um, spend some time with Bovis Lynn Lease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and was that more on the construction team there or some development? Well, that was, that was the story that I, that I told about sure. the first green building Okay, project. it was with Lynn Lease. Yeah. It was Lynn Lease, nice. which was called Bovis Lynn Lease at the time. Sure. And so you spent a lot of time in New York and... And now you're in sustainability within Turner Construction. Turner Construction, one of the most respected, largest contractors in the United States. So what's going on within sustainability at Turner right now? Well, um, uh, we're trying to uh, stay ahead of the curve, to stay current. One of the things that I tell people all the time is that sustainability is not a static thing. It's constantly evolving and changing and improving. Um, and as important as uh, LEED is and has been to the, to the whole sustainability movement, uh, there's more to it than LEED today. There's sure. other rating systems. There's other um, sustainability issues uh, that go beyond LEED. Um, the triple bottom line stuff, uh, uh, how do you sustain your people? How do you sustain your business? And, and now in the case of uh, you know, the advent of climate change, which is upon us now, and we're getting more and more extreme climate events, we have to deal with resiliency. I, mean, I used to say that sustainability is what we do to try to um, uh, preserve and reduce our impact. But now that that impact is having consequences, we have to know how to deal with it. So that's the resiliency movement. And then, and then as a construction company, we're now looking not just at what we build, but we're looking at how we build. And we're looking up the supply chain. We're looking at our own impact from construction operations. And we're looking at the embodied carbon and the materials we, we buy. Because there's a really, I mean, LEED used to be sort of focused on the design of a building. And it was a model to, to predict good behavior. And it was a way to reduce water consumption and increase energy efficiency and so forth, indoor environmental quality. All, all important stuff, but all focused on a building's life in, in service. You know, that, that 40 or 50 or 100 years that a building exists is when it has the biggest environmental footprint. And so the whole lead movement and the whole sustainability movement in the built environment is about uh, reducing that 80% of the problem, right? So 80% of the problem is in use and service, and then 20% is upstream in the supply chain, including the impact from building the building. So 
we have gotten really good at reducing uh, energy uh, in building operations. And so that 80% is now becoming less. And as we get more of our energy from renewable sources, that part of the impact is going to continue to decrease uh, to the point where we can build a net zero building with no energy consumption and no greenhouse gas emissions in operation. So that 20% in the supply chain that used to, we didn't even care about it because it wasn't important, is now all that's left. And that's, that's our footprint. So we're focusing on that. You're right. We can design and build green. We're setting up that infrastructure, but 80, 100 years is a lot of impact that we're, sometimes we forget about. Well, and, and the other thing is, um, if there is a date in the near future when we're going to tip and, and two degrees Celsius or more is going to be the reality, we only have a limited window, a, a limited amount of time to move that train, right, to, to, to stop that growth. And if you think about it, uh, even a net zero building is going to have a less of an impact in the next hundred years, but we've got to worry about today. So, so the operating energy is going to impact the environment slowly over time, but all of the embodied energy from the materials and the construction process, that all happens today. And the thing that we have to change, there's this concept called the time value of carbon, which is like the time value of money, which says that uh, a dollar invested today is worth more than a dollar invested tomorrow. So in the same way, a ton of carbon emissions avoided today mm. is worth more. It's cumulative, you're right. Because if we tip, we're tipped, and it's too late. No, you're right. Uh, you mentioned net zero. So that's one way for us to catch up. Uh, while we need to retrofit a lot of our existing buildings, you know, if you're putting out net zero buildings, we talked maybe Turner's done at least 10 net zero uh, buildings. Yeah, they're, they're not all certified net zero. Sure. But but some of them are, yeah. and some of them are, are what they call net zero ready, which right. means they were built to be net zero. Sometimes they haven't hooked up to the renewable okay. supply, so forth. What are some of the biggest challenges there? I, I assume it's the energy model, the iterations. you got to be super efficient so you don't need as many solar panels, but is it getting the contractor involved early? Well, yeah, absolutely. The integrated team always helps. Um, you hit it uh, on the head when you talked about efficiency, the, the best way to achieve net zero is to reduce your demand. So um, one of our first buildings, our project manager, pre-construction managers, it was a design build project. So we were, we were running the team Nice. and he made this interesting observation. He said, you can make any building net zero if you throw enough solar panels <laughs> at it, but that's an expensive proposition. So, so if you reduce demand, then you have, as you say, less, um, renewables that you have to buy. Um, and the keys to reducing demand are efficiency. That starts with a, a very efficient building envelope um, and, and um, uh, things like passive house strategies are really good for that. The way you orient the building, the fenestration, the, the, the insulation that you put in, um, taking advantage of passive strategies. All the stuff actually that used to be part of, of um, classical historic architecture right where you put the building where you face it all that we go back to that stuff we're halfway to, i mean if you think about it every building built before about 1800 was a net zero building because there were no mechanical systems in it right <laughs> that's a good point and so, now we're coming full circle that's right that's right and then and then you and then the other key of course is is to get your energy from renewable sources uh and i'm really you know the most exciting thing to me is that not only is our, our power generation coming more from renewables, um, you know, with battery storage, we can start running our equipment. We can, we can run construction equipment with batteries the same way, you know, and have, have electric drivetrains the same way we do with the automobile industry. Is that, that's exciting. Is that something you look at as, as a firm, as your impact during construction? Well, absolutely. Um, as I said, in that the in yeah. the old model, yeah. um, maybe 20% is, is supply chain, and, and of that 20, maybe 5% is uh, construction operations. But when you think about the fact that, that the built environment is the cause of about half of the total global greenhouse gas emissions, making 5% of that go away is a pretty significant contribution. And we can do that. We've got a, we've got a pilot program going right now where we are trying to calculate what our 
energy use and water use and fuel consumption is during construction because to be honest, I've been looking for a couple of years and I've talked to people in the industry, I've talked to academics and the researchers. Nobody knows how much energy it takes to build a building. We just assume the energy will be there and we use as much of it as we need. And it's time to start being efficient and looking for ways to reduce our impact. So that comes from renewable sources, it comes from uh, a new generation of construction equipment, uh, and it comes from, from saying how can we be more efficient and consume less and waste less. There used to be an innovation point within LEED if you had CFLs for your temporary lighting during construction, and, and that was a good start, but I'm sure there's so much more innovation Turner's looking at. I'm well, excited to hear yeah, that. I'm we'll very excited on, to hear we'll that. We'll be on CFLs at this point, course. And, we're, and we're into LEDs. Nice. And, and we're pushing that. Um, we're not the only ones, but, but sure. we, were, we were there early. And, and to be honest, uh, the early resistance was the price point. LEDs were very expensive, and you had to have a project that went on for a couple of years to get a return on your investment. But today, the last time I checked, the return on investment from LEDs was about three or four months yeah. because they, they're so widely available and, and, and the cost has come down. No, it's amazing. Those big projects take years to build, and you can get a good payback on even temporary lighting. Um, so let's talk about some projects. Um, we were talking earlier, Turner's working on some pretty big projects. Can you talk about a couple of those? Yeah, I'll say, I'll say first that um, for the last 10 years now, uh, about half of the work we've done is, uh, is green building, sustainable building. Wow. And, and of those maybe 95% of the certified buildings. So it's a big part of what we've done. It goes across all of our market sectors. It's uh, uh, commercial buildings, it's educational facilities, it's healthcare. Um, so so it's, it's a really pretty standard operating procedure these days. I know you you have a lot of data about your projects and your professionals, and we encourage everyone listening to the podcast to get lead credentials. I believe you have over 1,300 lead professionals, which is amazing mm-hmm. firm-wide. And, uh, but you also track, you're right, the, the projects, which ones are lead version 4, which ones are lead version 3, and product type. So I'm, I'm happy to hear you, you monitor and act on that data. Yeah, and, and, well, it's very useful to yeah. us because at this point, Somebody somewhere at Turner has probably done everything. Sure. Uh, so if, if we get a new project or if we're, you know, we're, we're um, chasing a new project and if it has, you know, solar panels or if it has geothermal or if it's a net zero or a living building, we can say, yeah, we've done that before and we can bring the people who have the experience and the lessons learned to do it in the, in the most efficient way possible with the best outcome. What are some projects, though, you've really enjoyed working on over the last, you know, 10 plus, 10, 15 years? Oh, well, I love the iconic projects okay. and, the, and the groundbreaking projects. Um, before I even got to Turner, uh, we built the Genzyme building in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was one of the very first lead platinum buildings. Nice. And is still, I think, one of the best buildings anywhere. It's a wonderful building very sustainable, great space to be in. Um, and then soon after I got here in 2005, we we won the, the job to build the Kroon building at the Yale School of Forestry, wow. which was um, another great building, um, lead platinum, uh, very energy efficient. Um, and, then, and then on through the years, uh, we did the Phipps uh, yeah, Conservatory, the Phipps Center for Sustainable um, Landscape. Yeah, we uh, talked about that project, uh, Net Zero, Living Building, Well, Lead Platinum. Uh, we've got to be one of the greenest buildings around. Yeah, yeah. And you get you get a reputational advantage of doing that. But um, one of our project execs said to me once, he said, Besides, you know, being lead certified, these are just really cool buildings. <laughs> sure. They're wonderful you spaces to be in. The technology's great. Um, so it, it's really, you know, we're really proud of, of um, the fact that we've done all these things and sort of been out in front of it. And now with the, the growth that we, you know, we talked before about resiliency and health and well-being, the built environment, the demands we place on the built environment and the things we require of it are changing. Uh, and, and our job is to, is to provide those spaces for people. And we've talked, and I think we agree that the advanced users of lead, maybe it's just commonplace now, and maybe we need that 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 new program, that next chapter, and and maybe right now it is wellness. And I love that you mentioned resiliency; couldn't agree more. So 
Um, I know you have well APs on the team. There's well, there's fit well, but as a contractor, I, I know you're getting ready for those clients. Uh, you've done some well projects. So quick thoughts, though, on wellness uh, and why it's upon us now. Well, um, <laughs> it's hard to not say you know, well. Yeah. Health, health and well-being has always been part of uh, lead and, and sustainability from the triple bottom line standpoint. Yeah. But the first version of lead had, um, you know, ventilation requirements and low VOC requirements, um, which was all about providing a healthy space. And we knew, you know, in 2001, 2003, um, the, the studies, the early studies on um, the impact on health and well-being and productivity and worker satisfaction, depending on the quality of the space that they're in. And, and over time, that's become um, more important and more sort of front of mind. And to be frank, part of it was driven by, by um, uh, pro the profit motive, you know, the business case, sure. uh, which is if, you're, if your people are happy and healthy and they want to come to work and uh, they're more productive when they're there, your company will do better. You can attract and retain the best uh, employees who want to come to work for you. And I think that's uh, especially important with, with the new generation of workers who who care about that stuff and who are going to make their decisions about where they work and what they do and who they work for based on the quality of life that they can have while they're working. No, you're absolutely right. Um, well, let's talk about that career path and, and mentors. I know there's several within this company that would call you a mentor, but Michael, along the way, did you have any mentors that really – uh, maybe invested some time in you. Sometimes mentors are those you don't meet with in person. They are those that you you really uh, look at as a role model. But did you have any mentors along the way? I had many mentors, um, and and I think of mentors not only as people who are with you to guide you, uh, you know, in a in a sort of a, in a parent child relationship. Sure. You know, some a guidance. boss, a boss who's a mentor, somebody older that's that's with you a, a teacher perhaps okay um but i also think about people who were in my life either totally by coincidence or by design who who opened a door for me mm. and one example is when, when when i was finishing my performing career and i had really no idea what i was going to do and it took me a couple of years to figure it out and when someone told me about the the historic preservation program at columbia I went up and I interviewed with the head of the department at the time, whose name is Michael Quartler. Okay. And and he took a liking to me for reasons I, I'm not quite sure of. I had a vague notion of architecture and design, and I was, you know, sort of a carpenter. And he accepted me into the program at Columbia. Wow. And opened up basically the whole rest of my life. Mm. Then then when I graduated from Columbia, there was a woman called Hillary Brown who worked uh, for the city, and I eventually was hired to work for her. And again, I had a master's degree from Columbia, and I knew something academically about preservation. Didn't have a whole lot of experience, um, but she, she took a chance on me and allowed me to work and learn on the job. Um, and, and we're still friends, and, and I valued that always um that's amazing yeah uh, and then and then you know in the sustainability world um i mean the us gbc and everyone who was associated with its creation and its early years all of those people were were inspirational some of the early board members who were still around some of the early thought leaders uh, on design uh just they they created something out of out of whole cloth they they took ideas and best practices from all over and gave us um, a checklist and a, and a guide and a, and a guide to, of, of what to do and then a scorecard to see whether we did it or not. And it, it changed it changed the construction industry in New York. And now that so many people are in, in lead buildings, it's, it's changed, you know, the built environment. Yeah, I mean, the USGBC, their mission has come true. We design and build and operate our buildings differently and, and share those best practices. Um, for anyone listening, though, mentors, I'm a big fan of mentors. Some of you might be seeking mentors, but like what happened with Michael, someone 
took the time, slowed down, and and just opened a door. And who knows where that could help someone else. So look around. Is there a door you could open for someone? That's so important. And and, and to be honest, one of the things I like the most about my job and, and being the old guy in the room now yeah. is, is that I can do that to other people. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue to my next question, which is, what's your specialty? What's your gift? Um, what, what are you really good at uh, in your career here? <laughs> well, if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, good question. Um, I would say first and foremost is passion. Okay. Uh, I can get very passionate about things that I care about. Um, to the point where I can be a little off-putting, I think. So sometimes I have to keep it in check. Um, I know I was I was asked to, to join the group of people who um, started the USGBC chapter in New York in right. 2001. Wow. And uh, I eventually became the chair of the board for a couple of years. And um, this was at a time when uh, there were actually no members. My first job, my first work with them was, was being the, uh, the head of the membership committee. And we were sitting around going, well, who the heck is going to be our members? And what, are, what, would, what can we offer them um, to, that would make them want to become a member of, of, our, of our group? And it was a working board, and we were all volunteer, and we, we thought the thoughts and did the work. And, you know, we organized... Um, uh, workshops and, and lectures and education, and, and grew the thing. And a lot about a lot of it was sort of sort of flag waving and encouragement and, and education. And I was good at that. I I, I um, I'm more a sort of an entrepreneurial early stage guy than I am a person who um, runs a large mature organization. I mean, in terms of what I would do if you let me do whatever I wanted. No, I totally get that. And uh, one of my mentors who was on the Green Building Matters podcast said, you can't fake passion. And so you're right. You can really get uh, the team excited. Uh, I know you love to teach internally within mm-hmm. Turner. I saw you've also taught some at Columbia where you got your master's. So can you speak about teaching? And is that something you really enjoy doing? I do enjoy it. Um, I think... Being a good teacher is one of the hardest things I know of. Um, when I taught at Columbia, it was, you know, uh, in the graduate school, uh, continuing in, in night school, essentially. I'm sure. sure. There's a better way to put it. Um, but it was it was one night a week for three hours, uh, and I did it after my day job. Nice. And it was exhausting. Okay. Um, and rewarding. Um, but, but people who teach, who can take the time, teaching is, is not about you, it's about your students, and um, to give them something and to watch them grow and to watch them get it is very exciting. And, and um, I come back to, I think education uh, is, is sort of the solution to everything. <laughs> if, you, if, if you give people information, um, they will they will do the right thing with it. It empowers them. I mean, that's how I started my companies in this green building movement is there was a lot of confusion and misinformation about green buildings. What's it take? What's the lead? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. That, that, that's a good point. You, this is your this is your business, yeah. and, and you know that full well. Um, you know, and I think with teaching, one of my favorite slogans, it's on a T-shirt, I'll, I'll have to get you one, is teach everything you know. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I, I really believe that. I, I also believe that that um, um, holding information, and, you know, being proprietary and secretive, yeah. um, doesn't doesn't help anybody. That that we all rise together. So if if I have anything or have done anything that other people are interested in or they find value in it, I'm more than willing to share it because just just I know it'll come back to me in spades. Good, right? And and if we all did that, I mean. Lots of the things that I've uh, cared about and tried to to do in the construction industry, I've shared with with my peers. Um, you know, the sustainability folks, people who have a job like mine in in, uh, in other companies, um, we're like a little band, you know, and and um, uh, we always go to each other for information and support, um, and and that's one of the reasons why it's been so successful. And now there's a whole new generation of people coming along. 
uh, and they're going to have a whole bunch of new ideas, and they're going to take it uh, to the next level. And we can keep learning from them. Um, let's talk productivity for a minute. Um, do you have any routines or rituals? How do you how do you stay uh, on point? What's helped you be successful? Wow. Um, I think I think um, a certain kind of discipline, um, which I actually learned in a dance studio. You know, in dancers. You never, you never stop learning, and you never get to where you want to be, and you always go into the classroom every day, and and you, you do it again, and you try to do it better, and um, that's carried over into my life. The thing about, not quite so much now, but when I started um, in sustainability, there was no rule book on, on what it meant to be... Um, the chief sustainability officer the, or the head of sustainability for any kind of a sure. company. Sure, new. So, so uh, the hardest part of my job was figuring out what to do. So a lot of it is taking in information and then and then putting that information back out to the people that can benefit from it. So I spend a lot of my time every day still, um, you know, reading and. and I don't do formal research per se, but I'm always reading what's next. I tend to focus on the middle distance to see what's coming down the road um, so that I can say to the folks at Turner, hey, this is going to be important. This can help us build better buildings. This can help our clients. And we need to get smart about it so that they pick us to build their projects. Um, and that kind of discipline, I'm thinking of Joseph Campbell, the the, the teacher and, and writer who wrote the book on um, um, myths and, and he said this thing about one, one of the myths was the myth of the warrior and how you had to be disciplined to do your, do your work every day. And, and he said he applied that to himself. He, he sat in an office and read books and, and you know, did research and wrote all day. So you don't have to be out there doing physical <laughs> things, but you have to have a discipline and a focus to get whatever you got done. And um, I think that's important. Discipline and focus. Uh, that sounds like an amazing book. I'll, I'll look into that. Is there another book maybe you've read recently or listened to you'd recommend uh, to anyone listening? Maybe it'd be a good gift. Wow. Um, you know, I try to keep up on the, on the, the books in the, in the um, sustainability world. Um, Paul Hawkins' new book. Yeah, John 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 John. Sure. But I'll, I'll tell you a secret. Mostly when I leave work, I want to leave uh, in all ways. So the reading that I do tends to be um, fiction, not fiction. And, and I, I kind of like historical fiction. I'm a big fan oh, of okay. Paul. Nice. Um, and uh, um, so, so I don't, I don't tend to, to, to be wonky when I go home. I, I tend to be wonky at work. And <laughs> Sure. Sure. Yeah. I love it. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of the bucket list. Um, I have a big bucket list with a lot of adventure, but a lot of just, I think this will make me happy. And I try to do about five things a year. It's a big list. What are one or two things, Michael, on your bucket list? I don't have a very big bucket list. Sure. Um, and I, I don't know if this is going to sound, I don't know how this is going to sound, but I think I've mostly done what, I, I've tried to do things that were meaningful to me always. So, Along the way, right? yeah. But I, I will say the, the one thing, the one place I want to go yeah, is sure, Machu fair. Picchu. Wow. I've always been fascinated by the fact that that it exists yep. and that people live there and, like, how did they get there and why did they stay there yeah. and how come it's so beautiful and, and sort of um, mysterious and... And mystical, so okay. so that that's on my bucket list. It's actually on my bucket list too. Some of my fraternity brothers had gone a few years ago, and I was just so envious. It looked amazing, and uh, who knows? Maybe we can take a trip. But there Machu Picchu. Uh, lastly, uh, career advice: green building career advice. Maybe someone listening is jumping into this green building movement, not just out of school, but making a career pivot. Any green building career advice? If you want to be a green builder, you have to be a builder. And, and I'm going to take a step back from that and, and say, if you're passionate about sustainability, and I think it's a wonderful thing to be passionate about, you have to apply it to whatever it is you want to do. So uh, one of the things that's amazing to me is I, I came to sustainability through the built environment. And that was how I heard of it, and that was sort of what it was when I 
started. And now every kind of company, every kind of organization, whether it's a university or a hospital, is aware of and concerned about sustainability, whatever that means to them. And, and um, we can now, we now educate people in sustainability so you can get a, a bachelor's in sustainability or a master's in sustainability. But that in and of itself isn't going to get you a job. You're going to have to have, whether you're a builder or an accountant or a doctor, or I don't care what you are, you can approach your work with a sustainability focus. I, there was a young lady who I met once. I was at a conference and someone asked me if I would speak to this young woman who, who had just graduated from college and she wanted to go into sustainability. And um, I said, sure, and I met her and I said, I said, so what do you want to do? And she said, I want to save the world. And I said, well, great, that's your religion. What job do you want? There you go. So, so we're Tactical. all passionate about sustainability, yeah. and it doesn't matter whether we're recycling our trash at home or, or buying low VOC paint, but it has to be applied to something. Great advice. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. You're a gentleman, a scholar. I learned a lot more about you, and I know we have a good relationship. Uh, so thank you for being part of GBS and so many people on your team using our study tools. But uh, I know you gave some nuggets here that are going to inspire uh, some others listening to make a, a career out of green buildings. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure. Charlie, anytime. time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues. And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.